I have to mention a little bit. I'm, those of you that weren't here for Sabbath school, we spent six years in Chad, with 12 to 18. We spent three years in Nigeria from uh, 69 to 72. Uh, and we've been in multiple countries since then. Uh, I enjoy missions. And I truly believe, and go ye into all the world. The song that we sang in the beginning of Sabbath school, I'll go where you want me to go. That's one of my favorite songs. And so, uh, I have to tell one little story about my grandmother. You know, you had a good story here, but I have to throw one in. My grandmother was a German immigrant from Russia. Uh, many years ago, and um, when I was a little boy, I remember she was a woman of prayer. And I can remember one day, I was maybe five years old or something, she prayed for this terrible rainstorm. My dad and my grandfather were down in the, down the river bottom farming. Uh, she prayed that the rain would stop, and it stopped. But another time, she was alone in the house, wood stove, had a fire going to bake bread and so forth, and she heard a roaring in the attic. There was running water. Running water meant you ran down to the spring and you bring it up in a bucket, which is half a quarter away. Now anyway, I'll break the story short. She prayed, and that fire went out that was in the attic. The house should have burned down, but she prayed, and the fire went out. She was by herself. Some years afterwards, I remember after uh, my folks moved down to Oklahoma from Missouri, where this story happened, we go back to that old house, climb up in the attic, and see the charred rafters. Proof that there was a fire. We were in Chad for six years from 12 to 18, and this story, we were also there last year, January of 22. But I have to mention a little bit about Chad. Those are, uh, as you see on the map, it's in the heart of Africa. Uh, Well, you can see it right there. <laughs> We're in southern Chad. And I meant a few little facts about Chad. Well, still got problems, huh? Now it doesn't want to advance. There we go. This is an aerial view, Google view, of Barry Hospital compound. I might mention Barry's little village in the southern Chad there of about 35,000 people or so. But uh, if you come tonight, I'll show you some pictures of downtown Chad. <clears throat> anyway, this... Uh, is the old picture when we first arrived. That's where our, we were with our daughter. It's an OBGYN doctor, our son-in-law's uh, ER doctor. And uh, if you don't know, can you see my arrow? Not very good. Anyway, uh, we lived in an apartment there for the first two years. And then, uh, the, anyway, the hospital building's old. And then a more recent view of it, Probably most of you have heard of Garvin McNeilis. You know who he is? Anyway, he he, his company designed buildings for Barry Hospital. And, they, uh, and so these were built in 2014, I guess it was. And a Maranatha group came out and put up these buildings 
uh, all those white roofs for new buildings that they put up. There's a nursing school. Uh, I don't know if you can see my arrow. Anyway, nursing school there, a new maternity ward there, because when we arrived, all babies were delivered in one little cubicle about the size of this right here. And uh, it was a little crowded. And this was kind of a VIP ward, and these little shelters for families to kind of camp in. Because hospital dietary was patients' families supplied the food for the patients. There was no hospital dietary. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I see the water tower, oh yeah, right there. Shortly after we arrived, the uh, main toilet for the hospital caved in, so uh, it's not flush toilet. Most Chadians don't know how to use a flush toilet, or don't even know what it is. And, this, and there's a latrine, anyway, and now it caved in. And so then the only other one that they all had to go to was a little one that they had in the TB ward area. Uh, which makes it a little challenging. We eventually built <clears throat> another latrine on the west end, on the end of that building there, or that one. That was once a church, but now it's a pediatric ward, and the west end, and then that end of it, whoops, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we built a toilet there, and the problem was they don't know how to use toilets really. They put in sticks and tire, different things in it. Anyway, so what's a little bit about Chad? Shortest lifespan in the world, lifespan of about 47. Worst place to be a woman, as they have no rights, they're just property. Worst place for a child to get ill, and incidentally, it is a little bit dangerous. The um, <clears throat> James Appel, some of you have probably heard of, uh, that was in the hospital, running the hospital before we came. He lost a child to malaria. And as you know, the mosquito is the most dangerous animal in the world, kills the most people. Uh, and a, uh, Gary Roberts also lost a child to malaria. One of our grandkids almost died with malaria while we were there. And so it's dangerous. The worst maternal mortality rate. A lady has a one in 10 chance dying with childbirth. That's pretty high. Um, neonatal, there's a high percentage of babies that are either born dead or die shortly thereafter. Um, <clears throat> 25% will die, and some statistics say 50% will die before age five. A typical lady history would be gravid of seven or eight, you know, seven or eight pregnancies, and uh, three or four are living. Difficult country to do business in. It's very uh, corrupt, one of the most corrupt countries in the world as far as government. Most worst country for travel and tourism. It is not a tourist destination. There's almost no tourists there. The only airport of the country is one gate, which gives you an idea of how much travel there is. Although the, the uh, fr French airline, Air France, comes there uh, let's see, three times a week, four times a week. There's air. Uh, Turkish air and Egypt air that comes once a week. Uh, anyway, you have to plan your flights accordingly. Just some fun. Here in America, for every thousand population, there's 837 vehicles. I, I actually think it's more than that. <laughs> Whereas in Chad, there's six. The good point about Chad, you know, we talk about carbon emissions and so forth. Chad has almost zero, whereas America's 519 
electricity. Almost no, there is no public power in Chad. Uh, so only electricity if you have a little generator of some sort. In America, it says 1,377 watts. I actually think it's more than that. But anyway, that was the numbers I had. Least happy, most negative country. 35% of women are married before age 15. 72% before 18. And about half of them have first pregnancy before 18. <clears throat> HIV is, is fairly common. It says 6%. I actually think it was about 10%. Some other official numbers say 10%. But compared to Botswana, it's 25%. Uh, and only 8% have a skilled birth attendant. A skilled birth attendant just means that somebody has watched somebody do a delivery and is, are there with them. <laughs> and then our text. Anyway, we were out there last year. Our daughter uh, was needing surgery. And so I was going out there to take over do surgery and so forth while she was back in this country to get a hysterectomy on herself for a big fibroid. And <clears throat> January 20 of last year, I woke up a little after midnight and my wife was kind of off the edge of the bed, tangled up in mosquito net would not respond. I yelled, I screamed, I prayed, Lord, why would this be? That's part of my title, why? Why would you let this happen? Could not respond, get her to respond. I immediately called my son-in-law and he comes running over. Um, just no response. And so we got IVs going, we did a quick blood sugar, sugars was normal. Uh, and so IV's running and IV antibiotics going, and then we did a spinal tap, which showed that. Spinal fluid's supposed to be clear. And so it meant that she had bacterial meningitis, which, if you know statistics, anybody our age, 80 years old, here in America, about 90% of them will die here in America. Uh, and so here we are in the heart of Africa with this going on. She also turned out to be COVID positive and malaria positive too. Um, so we, IV, IV, large doses of ceftriazone antibiotic, large doses of steroids, dexamethasone, and then um, we also threw in acyclovir and we also threw, started on a continuous drip of quinine for the malaria. <clears throat> um, the grandkids were there, and uh, there's some, fortunately, uh, Andrew, who's now back in this states, was a doctor there. Uh, took on some of the other doctors because I had scheduled that day eight surgeries I was going to do, but they didn't get done. Uh, some of the nurses, Sonam and Powell, Powell's from Poland, very good, very bright young man. Uh, he also did anesthesia. And uh, everybody watched the kids. Everybody worked together. Jonathan Dietrich, I don't know if any of you know him. How many have heard of Desert Tree Ministry? He's done, trying to get publishing work going there in Chad. Uh, This is our ICU. Ha ha. Um, in a little room where we were staying while we were there. Uh, see the IVs running. And that other second picture, you see the sawhorse. That's how we elevated the head of the, head of the bed so she could breathe better. During that first day, she quit breathing several times. I shook her, I woke, I yelled, I screamed, I prayed, Lord, why? 
But, because we knew the statistics, how bad they are. That's one disadvantage of being medical. You know some of the statistics that aren't good. But anyway, after that first day, it looked like she's going to live. And uh, so immediately, Olin started calling people hither and thither. Of course, the Adventist prayer network literally goes around the world. And some of you here in Sierra Vista also heard about it. Trying to get evacuation back to the States. Not real easy to the heart of Africa. Most of the evacuation teams won't go there. And if they do, they want 250000 or $500,000 to do it. Finally, after many calls, uh, found one in Canada that would do it for only 120000 uh, With many phone calls, the kids and myself, we figured if we pooled all of our credit cards, we could maybe come up with that much money. Uh, unfortunately, we had made the mistake of not getting signed up on evacuation insurance, which really cost very little, but somehow we didn't have it. So, uh, again, fortunately, we know lots of people in high places. How many of you know Richard Hart? Dr. Hart, you know, president of Loma Linda, president of Adventist Health International, which is really his baby. He's a fantastic man, a friend of ours. In fact, he was just two years behind me in medical school, so we've known each other a long time. But anyway, he fronted the money to get the evacuation going. And uh, so yeah, Friday, and so by Monday, we were to meet the evacuation plane which is, remember, is a 10 or 12 hour drive away. But there was another mission group that had a plane, Mission Aviation Fellowship, that was a 13 seater. And so uh, they were able to come down to our dirt strip and pick us up on Monday, take us into the capital uh, where we met the Canadian evacuation team. During all this time, IV antibiotics and all these things that I mentioned were running. <clears throat> uh, Monday evening, the Canadian uh, group was a doctor, a nurse, physical therapist, I mean, yeah, and uh, two pilots. And uh, they had an onboard lab which showed she was COVID positive and also that Olin was COVID positive. I was COVID negative for whatever reason, which turned out to be an answer to prayer in a bit. Because if she's COVID positive, they said, we can't take her. I might mention before that, during this time before that, there was some plane in Loma Linda that was, they said they would take her for free. Plane was down with maintenance problems. Another one in Las Vegas, same thing. How many times can you go up and down, up and down? COVID positive, eventually, couldn't go. Anyway, they called in another plane, an isolation pod, two days later. But during that two days, uh, the mission group there in Capitol, let us use our pickup, put her in the back of a pickup to take her to this house that was empty and keep things going. Uh, so that, by that time, that's Wednesday, and they were going to take her. We had friends in France that would take care of her, but then when they found out she was COVID positive, they wouldn't take her. Then our Adventist hospital in Berlin said they would take her, and finally the... Uh, Evacuation doctor said, okay, we'll take her to Berlin. He was insisting on these various tests, CTs, X-rays, cardiac workup, and the whole bit, lab. That was not even available there in Chad. There's only one CT machine in Chad, and it was down, not working. So anyway, finally, they, 
and I, I saw the uh, evacuation doctor was insisted that she be intubated, you know, tubed down and be sedated. But anyway, they got her to Berlin and did all these tests, and she was looking okay. And so then they went back to this country, uh, finally. And finally arrived nine days after it all started in Fayetteville, Arkansas, regional hospital there where another one of our kids is in charge of the nursing in the ER. When we got there, um, finally I was able to see her. Oh, I forgot to show a picture too. That was our Doc uh, Koval, the Polish nurse, and myself. <clears throat> Yes, yeah, so at first we didn't even ask for evacuation because didn't think she would survive. <clears throat> and our grandkids, they were playing hospital. <clears throat> uh, I guess I got ahead of my slides, but anyway. So she was flown. Uh, and oh yeah, incidentally, January 25, Danae was scheduled to have her surgery, and then she was thinking, do I get it done? But we all told her, hey, there's nothing she could do about what was out there, so she, she was encouraged to go ahead and have it done, and, when she, and she did okay, even though it was a complicated surgery. This was in the house there, our ICU there in capital city is just an old vacant house. And she was kind of responding a little bit then. The, our Jonathan Dietrich had this Land Rover that we took her in and then took her to the plane and there's the plane that took off and then inside the plane up to the capital city. And then there's the jet that she went on. Um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, I mentioned that. <clears throat> yeah, the house in the capital, and couldn't go to France. Lots of prayers. Then they had her surgery. <clears throat> um, had to intubate her in the airplane hangar before they'd let her go into this isolation pod, which is kind of like an overgrown body bag. Those of you that have worked with um, medical examiner cases or whatever, <clears throat> as you can see, it's there in the airplane hangar where she was finally put into the pot isolation pod. Finally, she got on the plane. Uh, I had, I saw she was going, and so I had to come home commercially. And I, and I had to get yet another test for COVID before they'd let me on the plane. Fortunately, I answered a prayer. It was negative again. And finally, to the emergency room and Danita, our daughter. And as she got to Arkansas, uh, she was, being she was COVID positive, and they tested her. Yeah, it was COVID positive there too. So they put her in the isolation there in the hospital there in Fayetteville. And so I got to see her, well, at least when she arrived, but they wouldn't let us in a few days later. And following, finally, the following Sabbath, they took her out of isolation. But while she was still in isolation, the hospital chaplain there was very helpful. They arranged Zoom calls for all of us kids and us to be on there. So there was a Zoom call with her and with Dolores in the hospital bed, myself and Jay, Oklahoma. One daughter was, happened to be down in Roytown, Honduras at the time, and Olin back in Chad, and Danette just is immediately post up was back in Cleveland, Ohio. So it's quite a Zoom call. Uh, 
the first day that the Zoom call, some a nurse had thought there was a little bit of movement. We didn't see any. Denise, no, nah, it's nothing. But the following day, there was movement. She moved her hand. All this time, the prayer network was going full blast. I'm also a friend of a, our conference president, and he got us on the uh, North American Adventist Prayer Network. And, uh, and incidentally, she was also on the Mormon Prayer Network and the Baptist Prayer Network as well. And she started responding, and the next day she was trying to pull out her tube even. And finally, uh, they were able to take her tube out. And she could talk a little bit. Didn't make sense, but it didn't matter. And then on the Zoom call, she was actually able to recognize some of the kids a little bit. And then after, let's see, 10 days in the hospital, I'll have to shorten up the talk because I said, Dolores told me to be sure and keep it in time. <laughs> and I have to mention also, I left out something key. There in Chad, Jonathan Dietrich acted as chaplain. We also had anointing for her there in Chad before she ever left Barry. And special prayers. And the prayer network, I said, was activated around the world. Because we have, we've been in a lot of countries and we have friends in a lot of places. A doctor friend in Hamburg, Germany. Some people in the Philippines, some people in Mongolia, some people down in Zambia and different places that were on this network that knew about it. <clears throat> also, before I forgot to mention, I have to mention a few things. We had our group back here that was giving Bible studies to on Zoom network. So we also had a Zoom Bible study from Chad to the group back here. On that, that was that's two days before she was comatose. She didn't feel well, and so she didn't participate as usual. But anyway, the group was very nice. And we all, of course, prayed together. And then the following week, after I got home, the group was a very special group. <clears throat> And so James 5, 13 to 18 talks about getting prayer for the sick and anointing. And, uh, <clears throat> As you can see, I'm bypassing a bunch of my notes. But. Psalms 88, 1 to 3, new, new Living. O Lord God of my salvation, I cry out to you by day. I come to you at night. Now hear my prayer. Listen to my cry, for my life is full of trouble and death draws near. That was our text that was very appropriate during that first two weeks. Literally thousands of people were supportive. Our kids were very supportive, but yet realistically, unfortunately or unfortunately, our family is all medically oriented. And uh, so they, they knew the, the odds. <clears throat> but then day 15, as I mentioned, she started responding 2 Kings 20, verse 5. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. <clears throat> On day 16, 
She was fully extubated and able to talk. Best Zoom. Psalms 47 was my text then. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. Even the weather, when she was non-responsive there in Fayetteville, we had a big snowstorm and it's ice cold and what have you. But when she started responding, the weather did too. <laughs> The snow started melting in sunshine. It was so beautiful. <clears throat> I had bought a uh, DVD player. I thought I'd play some music for her. Well, unfortunately, one of the side effects of the meningitis is deafness. And she still has partial deafness. And she still has poor balance. But we're so thankful. She's here. Yeah. So after the hospital of, of 14 days, then she was in rehab for another 10 days. And finally, in February 22, she was able to go to our oldest daughter's place. Our oldest daughter that lives in Oklahoma City is a, a physical therapist, and so she could get more physical therapy there. So the, the real question comes up, why? Why did this happen? Why did she get healed and somebody else did not? I don't have all the answers. God knows. I feel that, yes, God has a plan for us. He wants others to know that God answers prayer, that God is all-powerful, that God is awesome and loves every one of us. And why some would maybe not be healed, only God knows. <clears throat> so in our text, come let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears for the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. That's Psalms 34, 3, 4, and 7, and 17, and 18, and the New Living Translation. God is in control. We don't know all the answers to why certain things happen. You know, 2 Kings 13 talks about the death of the prophet Elisha, even though he was prayed for. Um, under the king Joash, and Joash come to him just before Elisha died, and uh, Elisha told him to shoot some arrows, strike the ground, and he only struck the ground three times, and Elisha got mad at him, angry at him, because he should have done it five or six times, and uh, signifying that Syria would be destroyed, but actually it would only be partially. So again, why the suffering? Why do we have people almost dying, or why do people die? Because Remember Lucifer, the great angel that was next to God in heaven, became proud and lifted up and wanted the honor and worship to himself. And he's still trying to do that today. Of course, you can, I'm not going to go into all of that, but Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, Revelation 12, 7, and so forth talks about how Lucifer was cast down to this earth. Woe to the inhabitants of this earth. The devil knows he has but a short time. 
And in th Revelation 13, 8, all who dwell on earth will worship him except those written in the book of life. I want my name, I want each one of your names in the book of life. We're, and I don't want any of you to have your name removed from the book of life. Because that can happen. <clears throat> We look forward to the time when sin and the devil and the cause of all of this will be thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus is coming soon. How many believe that? Yes. Amen. Amen. And as you see the events of the world today, it's going to be real soon, perhaps in our lifetime. I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven in my lifetime. I'm not that old yet. You know, four score that he talked about is, you know, that seems younger all the time <laughs> now that we've passed that. <clears throat> and so, uh, <clears throat> Second Peter 3.13, We look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. In Ephesians 2.8, For by grace we are saved through faith. It's the gift of God. We can do nothing of ourselves. It's a gift to God. We just have to accept it. Jesus is calling each one of us to be part of his kingdom. He's calling each one of us and wants us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has done it. Have we accepted it? Have we answered the call? You know, in Revelation 3.20, it talks about, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus wants to come in and eat with us. You know, I, so even today, a lot of business and everything is done over meals. And so Jesus wants to be with us, eat with us. And he wants us to in heaven with him. He's done everything that he can do for us. The question is, will we accept this gift? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Joshua twenty four fifteen, Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now is the acceptable day of the Lord. Father in heaven, we come to you. We're accepting of your gift of salvation. We're accepting of your grace. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your love and your knowledge that we should tell others. We're here for a reason. You're calling us tenderly to be your servants, to be your ambassadors, to be your witnesses to all around us by our lives, by what we say and what we do. Come near to us. Go with us from here. Keep us safe ready for your soon coming, which we pray will be very soon. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.